Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about a giant nuclear bomb because I think a video about a giant nuclear bomb will do pretty well on YouTube and especially because it's a Cold War thing. Yeah, you're watching Mega Projects. Some bombs are quite simply too big. On the 30th of October 1961, a modified Soviet Tu-95 bomber lifted off from Oyenya airfield in the far north of Russia. Attached to the bottom of this aircraft, as it was too big to fit inside, because of course it was, was a bomb of cataclysmic proportions. The testing that day of what has come to be known as the Tsar Bomber or Tsar's Bomb was an attempt by the Soviet regime to showcase their emerging might by unleashing the most powerful nuclear weapon the world had yet seen. At roughly 11.30 a.m. Moscow time, the Tsar Bomber was released and it began its slow, parachuted descent down into Novaya Zemla, a barren archipelago in the Barents Sea, as the two aircraft in the vicinity raced to escape the apocalyptic blast. Their chances of survival, by the way, had only been put at about 50-50. The nuclear weapons age began on the 6th of August 1945. In a flash, much of the city of Hiroshima was flattened by the American uranium nuclear bomb named Little Boy. Three days later, another plane entered Japanese airspace. Its target was the city of Kokura. But in one of those twists of fate that delivers salvation to some and death to others, cloud cover and smoke from the previous bombing raids obscured much of the city. The aircraft diverted to its secondary target, and Kokura was saved. But hell, was just redirected. Above the city of Nagasaki, the big man plutonium bomb drifted down from the sky, and once again, the sky lit up, and thousands died. The power of these nuclear weapons was all-consuming. Nothing like them had ever been seen, and suddenly one nation could annihilate vast swaths of the planet in an instant. The Japanese swiftly surrendered, and peace settled across the world, but let's just say it was a bit of an uneasy peace. The Soviet Union had suspected the Allies were building a nuclear weapon, and several spies even managed to infiltrate the Manhattan Project, the program that spawns the first nuclear weapons project, and we've actually done a video here on Mega Projects all about that. So, I mean, if you're interested in weapons that can destroy the world, why not give that a watch after, if you're not already too scared? Joseph Stalin no doubt received the news of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with rather mixed feelings. The US was, of course, a faithful ally of the Soviet Union during World War II, with the Americans going as far as pumping equipment and vehicles into the country that helped keep it going even as the Nazis came within a whisper of seizing Moscow. But let's be honest, Joseph Stalin was a maniacal tyrant whose dark shadow would remain over Eastern Europe for the best part of 45 years. His decision to abandon those taking part in the Warsaw Uprising in 1944 to the Nazis instead of ordering in the Red Army, which sat on the outskirts of the city to assist, was a way of gutting the Polish resistance without having to do any of the dirty work himself. I mean, not that it have minded from an ethical perspective, this is Joseph Stalin we're talking about. This was a man who had diabolical grand plans, and he must have looked on with greedy envy at the United States' new superweapon. So, once the terrifying might of nuclear weapons was truly revealed, the Soviet nuclear program kicked into gear. Like the Americans and the British, the Soviets too gathered as many German scientists related to the field as possible and pressed them into service to create a program that could rival the Manhattan Project. Slowly, the Soviet nuclear program did develop. I mean, how much of this was down to homegrown ingenuity and how much came from espionage is still keenly debated today, but you could probably guess which side the Russians sit today. No doubt the Soviets had some excellent scientists within their ranks, but it's equally clear that they certainly had quite a significant leg up, as I'm about to come to. The Soviets tested their first nuclear weapon, known as RDS-1 or Isolai 501, though the Americans referred to it as Joe 1, possibly the most American name for a Russian bomb ever, on the 29th of August 1949. To say that the speed at which the first test was carried out took the Americans by surprise would be a bit of an understatement. They had anticipated that it would take the Soviets five or six years to test the first weapon, but they'd done it in just four. This was perhaps partly explained with the arrests, convictions, and eventually 
potential executions of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg for espionage in the United States. The pair had acted as the linchpin for a US-based spy ring, passing on secrets to the Soviets, and they were the first American civilians to ever be executed for such charges. Things moved rapidly from there. Up until 1961, the Soviet Union carried out no fewer than 85 different tests. These ranged from small tactical nukes, not this small, but small, to the first hydrogen bomb, which was tested on the 12th of August 1953, and the first hydrogen bomb that lay in the megaton range on the 22nd of November 1955, called the RDS-37. Catchy. <sighs> Despite their blossoming nuclear program, Soviet leaders knew that they still lagged behind the United States. In a world where posturing and brinkmanship were quickly becoming the name of the game, welcome to the Cold War, the US clearly had the upper hands when it came to a nuclear deterrent. In 1960, it was decided that the Soviet Union needed to go big. Really, really big. In many ways, the Soviet authorities knew there wasn't a nuclear equilibrium between the two countries, but a gigantic nuclear test would not only make it seem like there was, but it would force the world to take the Soviet superpower rather seriously. The bomb that they created was monstrous in almost every way. It was 8 meters in length, about as big as a double-decker bus, with a diameter of 2.1 meters, and it weighed 27,000 kilograms or 60,000 pounds, and had an unspeakable blast yield of around 50 megatons. To give you an idea of that kind of power, here are a few points of comparison. That blast yield was over 3,000 times more powerful than what was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined, while also representing 10% of the combined yield of all nuclear tests to date. In terms of its destructive power, it was about a quarter of the 1883 eruption of the Krakatoa volcano, one of the most destructive eruptions that the Earth has ever seen. This was an eruption, by the way, that was so big, the sound wave apparently circled the globe seven times. But here's the real standout fact. The Saar bomber was 10 times more powerful than all the munitions used in World War II. Now, this is a statistic that's a little hard to get your head around. 10 times more powerful than every single bullet, bomb, explosive device, and grenade used throughout a six year war. This was a bomb of apocalyptic proportions. Another quite astonishing aspect of the Saar bomber was that it was only around half as possible as it was originally designed to be. The initial design called for a 100 megaton, three layered bomb with uranium layers separating each stage. However, it soon became clear to those involved that something of that size would be difficult to contain, and it might well affect the USSR itself. Soviet physicist Andrei Sakharov, who would later completely denounce the use of nuclear weapons, played a key role in the construction of the Saar bomber, and he was part of the wise reduction to only, only 50 megatons. Product 602, as it was first known, was not an entirely new bomb. Product 202 had been built in the mid-1950s, with a yield of between 15 and 30 megatons, depending on your source, and after successful tests, it remained in storage for a short period before being resurrected, and several of its components were used to build Product 602. The first design was a three-stage bomb, beginning with a nuclear charge, followed by a thermonuclear reaction, and finally, a fast fission process, ominously known as a Jekyll Hyde reaction, because of course it was. In this, a heavy atom absorbs a high-energy neutron called a fast neutron and splits, producing a massive amount of energy, even by nuclear standards. The last two stages were estimated to produce a 50 megaton yield each, while the first would generate only 1.5 megatons. Thankfully, common sense prevailed and the bomb was reduced to 50 megatons. This was done when the third and perhaps second stage had their uranium-238 fusion tempers replaced with lead tempers. These are also called neutron reflectors and essentially act to scatter the neutrons and so reduce their overall power. This meant that the fast fission process was completely eliminated, and because of this, 97% of the total yield resulted from the thermonuclear fusion, meaning that the Saar bomber was in fact one of the cleanest nuclear weapons ever because of the low amount of fallout in comparison to its yield. News of the impending Soviet test began to creep out about a month before the test itself. 
During his visit to the US, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had strangely mentioned the bomb to a US politician, and the information found its way into the New York Times on the 8th of September 1961. It's unlikely this would have been down to a slip of the tongue, and it was most likely a clever ploy to alert the world that something big was going to happen fairly soon. On the 30th of October 1961, a modified Tu-95 bomber, which had its engines, bomb base, suspension, and release mechanisms all redesigned, and then it was painted bright white to reduce possible radiation damage loaded the SAR bomber into its bomb holder below the aircraft. The massive nuclear weapon now represented 15% of the total weight of both the aircraft and the bomb combined. The aircraft taxied slowly into position before lifting off from the Alenia airfield. On board were nine members of the crew, and as I said right at the start of the video, their survival was put at no more than 50-50. Simply put, nobody was quite sure exactly what would come next. Flying close by to them was an observer aircraft that would film the explosion. Two hours after takeoff, with the plane now 10,500 that's 35,500 feet above Novaya Zemla, the largest nuclear weapon in history, was released. Attached to it was a 1,600 square meter parachute, which in theory would allow the bomber and the observer aircraft filming to get around 45 kilometers, that's 28 miles, from the blast site before it detonated. At 11.32 Moscow time, the Tsar bomber detonated with a ferocious power about 4,000 meters above the ground. Scientists had reasoned that the massive fireball would hit the ground, but the bomb's shockwave was so strong that it bounced back and prevented this. The fireball itself had a width of about 8 kilometers, 5 miles, and reached up to almost where the plane had dropped the bomb. The mushroom cloud was unimaginably big, reaching 67 kilometers, that's 42 miles up into the sky, which, by the way, is about seven times the height of Mount Everest. The cab reached a peak width of 95 kilometers, while its base spread out to 40 kilometers. The total power was thought to reach 57 megatons, and so exceeded expectations while mimicking a 5.5 earthquake on the Richter scale. The blast wave circled the Earth three times, and when it hit the escaping bomber, it caused it to plummet a thousand meters before the pilot regained control. That must have been absolutely terrifying. A small abandoned village on the island of Seveny, around 55 kilometers from ground zero, was entirely destroyed, while settlements hundreds of kilometers from the blast were affected, with wooden buildings being blown down and roofs being pulled off the stone ones. The flash of light was seen up to a thousand kilometers away, and communication systems in the area were badly affected for the next few hours. The massive nuclear test was met with, as you might imagine, global outrage. This was led by the United States and its allies. Considering that the largest US blast at that point had been 15 megatons, it must have been quite the bit of news, but I mean, what could they really do about it? The detonation of the Tsar bomber did exactly what the leaders of the Soviet Union had hoped it would do. It struck fear through much of the world and announced the USSR as a true nuclear power capable of flattening large cities in just a moment. A calculation made at the time estimated that if it had been dropped on Washington, D.C., it would have caused roughly 2.2 million deaths and spread as far as Pennsylvania. But oddly, the Tsar bomber proved to be a tipping point. The United States did not immediately run off and detonate something even bigger, and in 1963, the treaty banning nuclear weapon tests in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater was signed in Moscow, signaling an end to this kind of large-scale testing. The superpowers instead turned to smaller-scale nuclear weapons that could be carried by intercontinental continental missiles, and to this day, the Tsar bomber remains the most powerful man-made explosion that the world has ever seen. A cataclysmic show of might that caught the world's attention, but thankfully acted as the peak of large-scale bomb madness, at least so far. We've never seen anything like the Tsar bomber since, and always remember, it was supposed to be twice as big. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit the like button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.